Good morning. I'd like to use as a sermonic theme today, a people with a future. A people with a future. A friend of mine recently confided that all of the things one looks forward to in life have happened to her. She met the love of her life. She had kids. She had a family. She's had a good career. The major things are now finished, she concluded. I felt a bit of sadness for her. At 55 years old, she has declared that the best of her living is over. While holding this to be her truth, I pondered, what does it mean to feel the future hold so much less? And I wondered if others that have more life behind them than in front of them feel the same way. It got me to thinking, as we've been talking about building here at our church, I've heard a couple people say, well, I'm not even gonna be around when that gets done. And then I remembered some of my favorite authors published books later in life. They had more experience also, and their books were bestsellers. Toni Morrison published her first book at 40 years old. Paul Dietrich published his book, Foretaste, Leadership for a Missional Church at 91 years old. I started remembering how many folks at ripe ages were leading victorious lives. Gladys Rand completed her first marathon, nine hours and 53 minutes at 92 years old in Hawaii. Diana Nyad swam to Cuba from Florida, 53 hours at 64 years old. Barbara Hillary reached the North Pole at 75 years old. And do you know Colin, um, do you know Sanders that started KFC? Started it at 65 years old. That's why you see all that white hair on his head in the picture. And Nelson Mandela became the president of South Africa at 75 years old. But still, as one ages, it's harder, perhaps, to imagine the future. Does our vision grow dimmer? What is your vision for the future? This is where we enter the biblical text today. I know it's heavy. It's Jeremiah. Jeremiah is shaped by a national crisis. The Babylonian Empire impacted the Judean lifestyle for decades. Chapter 32 calls readers to a moment in the siege of Jerusalem, sometime before the Babylonians destroyed important public buildings, decapitated the national leadership, and impoverished the city. Sieges formed an important feature of warfare in the ancient world. An attacking army surrounded a city which would normally have a wall to block any entrance or exit into that city. Since most of the vital resources that supported life in a city, such as food and water, lay outside the city, it would be easily to starve the people. Soldiers would come out fighting in order to save their honor rather than die an ignoble death. A siege amounted to an imprisonment. For quite different reasons, it was hard for this community to imagine a future when their present moment looked so bleak. It's hard to think about tomorrow when it takes all your energy to get through today. Last week at the TPIRC summit, one presenter said, the church came out of COVID and 50% of our congregations did not return. And we are disoriented. This morning I was watching a mega church pews empty. Where do we go from here, folks? Folks are leaving and not coming back, or so it seems. We've been open a year. The church is shifting and some are beginning to wonder, does the church have a future? 
The text today is bleak. There ain't no sunshine. Professor Steve Davidson over there at McCormick Theological Seminary says hope in a future is hard to come by and that Jeremiah is reaching in this particular passage. He believes it is an unrealistic burden placed upon Jeremiah. There is no hope here. It just cannot be found. Maybe sometimes you have felt like that. We are living through a pandi pandemic, hopefully with the worst behind us. Economists say that financially we will feel this pandemic for the next 30 years. Prices have gone up, but our wages have not. We are running on less and working with more, navigating systems that are supposed to make our life better, but we can't even get a live person to talk to us when we call on the phone. We not only got a coin shortage, we got a compassion shortage, and com capitalism is killing us. The rich get richer and the poor are punished. The reproductive rights of women are under attack. Arizona trying to lead the, <laughs> lead the pack. And people these days do not have to smoke crack to have a psychological crack. The struggle is real. Such books have been described as survival literature. They explain the how and why people find themselves in such situations and how do they survive. In the midst of everything that is going wrong, and a lot is going wrong, Jeremiah is commanded to buy a piece of land, a seemingly pointless thing to do. In his explanation, God makes it clear that nothing is impossible. In the midst of a threatening disaster, a message of hope is given. This is not the end. Often for African Americans, shortly after slavery had ended, owning a piece of land was everything. Just a piece where one could plant and grow a crop, build a home, raise a family, have something that belonged to them under their ownership that someone couldn't take away. A piece of land is what can be cultivated. Dreams can find space to breathe. A vision can be casted. A people can grow. Buying this piece of land was everything, even when it appeared to be nothing. Jeremiah is offering hope, but it is not without challenge. Today, we might call what this community went through trauma. Trauma centers on experiences that are so distressing they assault us and impact us beyond words. And the thing about trauma is even after the incident is over, the effects are still with us. They are devastated. They are depleted. They were on lockdown in their own community. Trauma is when more happens to us than we are capable of being able to handle. Trauma is some real down in the valley existence. The land that Jeremiah purchased is a deposit on what is to come. This is God's relationship with God's people. Sometimes hope is all that is left in our pantry. They wanted restoration. They wanted renewal, heard that. They wanted to go back to the way things were. But what is in the pantry was their hope for the future. A friend of mine, her son plays basketball, and yesterday they saw Jesse Jackson Sr., and he was in a wheelchair. And I was like, man, the last time I saw Jesse Jackson, he was stumbling, but he was walking. And he was surrounded by an entourage of black brothers around him. He went to his daughter's graduation this year, and here he is at his grandson's little league basketball game. He could give in. I've heard people say, hey, he had a great ride. He needs to sit down. I can't understand what he's saying. But he keeps going. He keeps investing in a future that extends beyond him. Bruce Epperly says those who commit themselves to God's cause can imagine futures and act on their imagination, even in the arc of imagination that goes beyond their lifetime. Let us struggle to see the future even if we're not in it. For our children, for our grandkids, for our nieces and our nephews, the students on our block, the guy who got caught up, the human on drugs, the family riddled with death. Let us see a future. 
So Jeremiah bought the farm, locked in jail for his prophetic preaching. Jeremiah decides to buy a plot of land and makes a plan for the future. What an audacious image of hope. The nation is at a crossroad. Defeat and destruction are on the horizon. And the prophet takes a leap of faith, buying a property he will never occupy. A tree was planted in front of my home 20 years ago. It was a small little scraggly thing, but it's not that anymore. It's providing shade and it's growing large. They even had to cut off some limbs. That baby is growing large. That tree I know will live into a future that we probably will not see. We are supporting bees because bees support us and we need them in a future that we will not be around for. Mother Earth is crying out that we conduct ourselves a whole lot better for a future that we won't be around for. We will go to games and we will buy fundraising stuff from kids that we don't need and we will whisper affirmation in our young adult ears. We will support causes that have impact and we will give generously to support the work of the larger church for hands that can reach farther than ours can. Today I began talking about how each of us is an individual color, but when you put all of those colors together, it makes something different. We do something that we don't do anymore, but we have something called a potluck. And what's amazing about a potluck is when you start out, there's nothing on the table, but then each person brings what they have in their home. We kind of do potluck with offering too. We invite you to give. Over and over again, we practice this sense of generosity. We are a people, even if we won't be around to see it, that have a future. Because we are a people with a future. Amen. <laughs>